conference season is over. The parties have finished their internal conversations. Now it's over to the public to find out what they think. Tonight we're in Edinburgh. Welcome to Debate Night. Debate Night is the only show in Scotland where you get to put your questions to the people in power. Of course, the Greens conference still to come. We hope to have them on the show again soon, but on our panel this evening. From the SNP, the MSP for Adrian Shorts and Cabinet Secretary for Wellbeing, Economy, Fair Work and Energy, Neil Gray, previously a Westminster MP. Neil was born in Orkney and graduated from Stirling University. As a schoolboy, he carried the Orkney flag at the opening ceremony of the Scottish Parliament and went on to work in journalism before joining the SNP Press and Research Office. Sue Webber is a Scottish Conservative MSP for Lothian and convener of the Education, Children and Young People Committee. Sue worked in the healthcare sector for 25 years and got into politics during the independence referendum campaign, becoming an Edinburgh City Councillor before being elected to Holyrood. From Scottish Labour, Pam Duncan Glancy is MSP for Glasgow and the party spokesperson for education and skills. Elected two years ago, Pam's been active in the Labour Party for over 20 years before entering politics. She worked in communications for the NHS and has been a long-time campaigner on equalities and human rights. Also with us tonight, columnist with The National, Richard Murphy. Richard's a professor of accounting practice at Sheffield University. According to The Guardian, he's the radical accountant campaigning for fairer taxation and against tax avoidance. And finally, the CEO of Women's Enterprise Scotland, Carolyn Curry. As a banker, Carolyn was the first woman head of business lending at RBS. She now leads an organisation dedicated to raising the profile of women in business in Scotland. Please welcome them all to Debate Night. And of course, welcome to our studio audience. It's great to be with you here in Edinburgh. And you can join in the discussion from home, wherever you are in Scotland. BBC DN is the hashtag you need on social media. And our Debate Night podcast will be available for you to download straight after this broadcast. So let's get started. Our first question of the night comes from Molly Finlay. Molly. How does the SNP plan to fund next year's freeze in council tax announced at the party conference this weekend? Thank you, Molly. Um... Neil Gray, the Fraser of Allen's Institute said in a blog uh, this evening, it's not clear where the extra funding will come from to pay for the council tax freeze. Tell us. Well, we will find that money and it will be fully funded, uh, the council tax freeze, because we believe this is fundamentally important. Uh, one of the critical issues that people are facing right now is Westminster's cost of living crisis. That's and that is being felt. The question is, where's the money going to come well, from? Well, we have here? to find it within uh, government uh, resources. Of course we do. We have a fixed budget. Uh, and so we need to find it within the budget. And it's a choice that we make that we will be putting money back in people's pockets because we know that the number one issue that are facing uh, people, that is facing people right now is Westminster's cost of living crisis. Uh, people are dreading the bills that are coming through their doors. We are looking to respond to that in the way that we can to ensure that we are helping people through uh, that, this incredibly difficult situation where we've had uh, 18 months of spiralling inflation, spiralling food prices, spiralling uh, energy costs uh, and people at all levels, almost all levels of society are feeling the pinch from that. We're looking to return that back into people's pockets where we can. And it's an issue that we've consulted widely upon over the summer. Well, not with and Cosler, people, who said and, they didn't know anything about and, it. And the Greens have also said that they are disappointed by this. And obviously the discussions with Cosler are ongoing. The Deputy First Minister met with them. Um, but they didn't uh, with know leaders. anything about the announcement. Well, Deputy First Minister met with leaders tonight and the First Minister will be meeting uh, with them tomorrow to ensure uh, that we're able to find a way of taking this forward. Uh, we did consult widely with the public and I think all political parties uh, just about, uh, were uh, critical of any p prospect uh, of council tax going up. And some uh, local authorities in Scotland were considering putting council tax up by as much as 10% next year. We didn't think that that was right. And that is why we're looking to freeze council tax next year, put money back into people's pockets and ensure there is a protection from Westminster's cost of living well, crisis. Well, that, that, that's a good point. Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, Labour said over the summer that it was going to be a bombshell, the council yeah. tax rises. That's now been diffused. You must support this. The, the proposals that the, the government put forward would have meant that 80,000 of the lowest income families across Scotland would have been paying more in their council tax. That's not something that in the midst of a cost of living crisis, a cost of living crisis, in fact, that is hitting pockets all across Scotland and all across the UK, 
Um, and that isn't something we could have countenanced. Yeah, but hang my on, they're, they're not doing is, that. Council tax fear, is not being raised. So you must uh, support that decision, Major. So, so they're saying now that council tax is not being raised. It's not what they were saying um, before the summer, but they're not raising it now. My main concern, and Neil will know this, my main concern is that it's funded. And actually the first answer that, that you gave there, Neil, Could where you said we'll find that money, I think the mm. Scottish people would have expected you to know where the money was come from before you, before you made the announcement. Because well. our <laughs> services... Crucial services like social care, schools, parks, leisure facilities, libraries, all of these things rely on you getting this right. And if you don't know where you're getting the money for these commitments, then people should rightly be concerned. OK, let me hear from the audience. Gentleman of the glasses in the middle, yes. It does seem extraordinary to focus on freezing council tax as opposed to other means of helping uh, poorer families with the cost of living crisis. I mean, council tax is already mm. uh, a regressive tax, um, but by freezing it, you don't help people necessarily on the very lowest incomes who would get council tax benefit. Can you, but I'll, on, on I'll, the other hand, the saving okay. is greater for people at the top. OK, I'll come back to you in a second. Let me just hear the lady down here. Yes. I'd just like to know how that fits with your progressive tax policies where you mm -hmm. ask people who have a bit more to pay a bit more. Um, if you're freezing council tax for all, doesn't that benefit most people with high-end properties who you, can afford to you, pay you, more? You have said, you, as a government, you're committed to progressive yeah. taxation. How does this possibly fit with that? For, for, because we understand that people in a cost-of-living mm -hmm. crisis that we're facing just now, at, at most levels of society, are feeling uh, the pinch right now. And a property-based tax is, um, is a challenging regressive taxation, as the gentleman's pointed out. So and, why don't you and reform we, it? And, well, we, we like you said, you looking to, uh, we're still coming forward with looking at proposals <coughs> in order to do that. But to answer the gentleman's point that I was so keen to come in on, we are investing £3 billion in order to help ensure that we are supporting people on the lowest incomes uh, to address anti-poverty measures, uh, such as the Scottish Child Payment, which is £25 uh, uh, of support uh, going directly to those children and the families that need it most. That is not just an inconsequential uh, uh, in uh, intervention. It has been described by uh, poverty uh, anti-poverty campaigners as being game-changing. So yes, we are making those investments, but this is an investment to ensure that we're providing people with the support when they need it now. Now, the certainty that's coming next year to ensure that they know that this bill, that one of these bills, uh, there is going to be some protection from. Okay, because okay. the problem hold, that we're facing no, from Westminster's that thought, cost of living crisis Pro has Hang on, hang on, hang horrendous. on. Professor Richard Murphy, you're shaking your head at this. I am shaking my head at this because I really don't understand this. I'm sorry to say, but this policy makes no sense to me. Lots of things about Scottish tax don't make any sense to me, by the way, because that's the nature of the devolution settlement. I mean, you were strung up when you were given the tax deal you were given under that, and the SNP has to manage within that, as it's the government at the moment. But this really does not make sense. First of all, the SNP is managing a devolved government. I don't think you treated with your local authorities with the respect they deserve. Mm -hmm. And I know the mob at Cosler, because I've spoken at Cosler conference several times, I'm not surprised that they actually are quite annoyed with you, that you didn't consult with them. Because surely you believe in local democracy, and this walks cutting horses through the idea that they've got a decision to make. That seems to me to be quite wrong, from the viewpoint of Scottish democracy as a whole. But secondly, I mean, I found a reason for jurors tonight. I actually was researching questions around this, hoping it might come up. Um, uh, JERS is Government Expenditure and Revenue Scotland, which I've spent a lot of time talking about and usually call crap, which is a completely rubbish approximation to the truth. And on this occasion, however, it gave me the number for the amount of rates paid, council tax paid in Scotland. £2,760 million. Pounds. Now, the proposal that's been scrapped is, in fact, with regard to bands E to H, as I understand it, not with regard to bands A to D. So the people who are benefiting from this scrapping are those who are living in the higher-value houses. And just to be clear, that's 26% of houses in Scotland. Only half a percent are in the top band. And I reckon I came past quite a lot of those on the way to here tonight. And... This, therefore, is largely a gift to the better off in Scotland. And if you're interested in progressive taxation, and the SNP has almost no ways of delivering progressive taxation, because capital gains tax, inheritance tax, corporation tax, higher rates of national insurance, in, um, income tax on savings are all outside the scope of the devolution settlement. 
and therefore can't be controlled by Holyrood. This is one of the opportunities to deliver progressive taxation in Scotland, and it appears to have been foregone. That, to me, is not a good move. Okay. How right. much is okay. it going to cost? Can we just talk about that for a minute? Yeah, well, Neil hasn't said that, but I estimate... We have asked the question twice. Well, okay, I reckon it's going to be 175 million-ish. Now, that's the back of the envelope figure. It might be a plus or minus a bit, but that's roughly what I think it's going to cost. Where does that come from? Your pockets. Why? Because the Tory government in London has fixed allowances, income tax allowances, which are reflected in the Scottish okay, income okay, tax Richard, system. I'll, and I'll, that's I'll, going to raise extra money, which is going to be used to pay for the council I'll, tax. I'll come back to this in just, just a second, Neil, and I'll give you another chance to clarify on this. Carolyn Curry, do you agree with that? Some of it. I think for families that are facing the cost of living crisis, the certainty that council tax is not going to go up is a good message. You know, when you are living on a knife edge, knowing that some of your costs that you're expecting to go up are not going to go up, that is a good message and gives you some certainty. However, I think what we're seeing is the missing part is where is this going to be funded? You know, as Richard says, this is a large sum of money and it has to come from somewhere. How and where is it going to be funded? And what is the trade-off going to be? We know councils are facing incredibly difficult mm. decisions in order to deliver their services that people rely on. And for example, you know, in, in a cost of living crisis, it is not just being able to survive financially. We know from the businesses we work with that this current economy is having serious implications for people's physical health and serious implications for people's <clears throat> mental health. Now, councils deliver services like sports centres, swimming pools, libraries. These are essential services when you are dealing with people's well-being. So what is the trade-off, is the missing element here? How are we balancing the budget? Are we going to be facing a black hole? Are there harder decisions coming down the line, actually? And we may think, gosh, we wish the council tax had actually gone up a bit. Or are we going to feel pleased and relieved that the money is being found and the trade-off is acceptable? Let's hear it's more from clear. the people who will be paying this or not paying it, actually. On you go. I, I think that's, that's absolutely true. It, it's nice for some people to know that they're not going to be paying more council tax, but what about the services that are now not going to be funded as well for the people who live in the communities that need them the most. Um, I think that's who it's going to affect the most. Thank you. A man in the white shirt down here. Yeah. And this is not new. The SNP imposed council tax freezes for years mm -hmm. and we saw savage cuts to our local authorities as a result. Year after year after year of savage cuts. So we're going to get the same again, aren't we, Neil? Sue Webber, we're living in a cost of living crisis. This gives some certainty to people facing household bills over the course of the winter. It certainly does with Caroline, but remember the council tax would be changing next, it would be next April. And Neil Gray mentioned that he, would be, he was going to be giving money back to people. They're not getting any more money from this. They are just keeping their council tax bills as they are. And where I'm really finding it difficult to square the circle is, again, how is it going to be funded? And yes, the cuts that may follow at local authorities and the decisions that they might make that will impact on those people that are actually needing the very services there. In Edinburgh, it was the SNP group actually were proposing in the budget that we would all be having a 20% increase in council tax for those living in Edinburgh. That is what they were proposing back in April. And now they're all cock a hoop that their members in Holyrood have decided, or Hamza Yusuf stood up yesterday on a political platform and made it an uncosted announcement mm -hmm. with no idea as to where the money was coming from just for political gain yesterday. I just think it was really irresponsible of him. Have you made the decisions about where this money's going to come from? Do you know what's going to have to go to make way for this? It's, it's going to be subject to negotiation in terms of the level it's going to be fully funded to local government. And I think that... Where's it coming that from? That health? Is, Education? coming forward. But I find it incredible that we have Sue here describing the pressures on public finances. We're ab absolutely true, not just for local government, but for the Scottish government and the English local authorities who are currently going bankrupt. There is a common cause for this, and that is Tory austerity. She could help end it overnight if she would call she... for the UK government to finally invest in public services, not just in Scotland, but across the UK, because that is the pressure that we're all facing Scottish government uh, had the biggest settlement in oh. the history of devolution. <laughs> You're making decisions, the wrong decisions. £1.5 billion you have earmarked for your National Care Service Bill. That could be earmarked and sent much better 
driving services that people are looking for right now. Let me hear from the gentleman in the back row. Yes, on you go. Won't the SNP do what they always do and ask Westminster for more money? It seems a, a disgrace, the amount of money that's being spent by the SNP and squandered. Well, and I think the, the lady in the f uh, row in front of you, yes. Um, I was just wondering how this was affected by the fiscal settlement recently um, announced. Um, there doesn't seem to be, have been much scrutiny on, by the Scottish Government about how we could have got a better settlement and maybe avoided having to revert to things like this. Neil Green? The, the fiscal framework uh, yes. settlement. Um, so that was uh, carried out by negotiation and, and the details of which are going through scrutiny in the, in the, in the finance uh, committee. But I go back to the point, and the, the gentleman says, you know, we can ask for more money from Westminster. It's not just uh, the SNP Scottish Government that are asking for more money from Westminster because of Westminster's cuts. Uh, Labour-run Wales are asking mm. for more money because of Westminster's cuts. The Tory-led uh, authorities in England are asking for more money because of Westminster's cuts. Uh, because there has been a decade and a half of austerity and we're all feeling the pain and because of it. You know and it is high time that we finally saw some investment in public services coming from the UK Government instead of the decimation that we're Pam having. Pam The reality is, uh, I'm afraid to say, that both the Westminster Government and the SNP MP government have dug us in a hole. We've got no money left as a country. They don't know where they're going to where, where they're going to fund raise money all the different Pam? things. Because you're opposed to income tax rises. You're opposed to income tax rises. You're opposed to council tax rises. Not and you're looking no. and you're looking to follow no. the, uh, the austerity model. Rachel Reid has confirmed that she's looking to follow the austerity nonsense. model absolutely that has been nonsense. put forward by the we, Conservatives. Absolutely nonsense. What change you know are we going to get from Labour? You, you absolutely know that that is nonsense. The Labour government will bring a mission-led government with the economy and driving up the economy at its heart and you know it and our plan to drive up the economy has been fully costed unlike the sorts of funding announcements that the first minister stands up on a podium and makes and you asked the question about or, or someone asked the question how is it going to be funded the last time the council tax was frozen in Scotland it was funded on the back of social care and community care charges which both went up at the hands of a council tax freeze and we're still in a situation right now where people are paying astronomical amount of charges for social care despite the fact the Scottish government have said they will abolish them so this is exactly the situation that we're in in Scotland. We've got the government saying one thing, but they don't know where they're going to get the money okay. for it. All right, we're, we're going to stay with politics, actually, for our second question of the night. We're in Edinburgh tonight. Next week, we're going to be, for the first time, in Motherwell. So if you'd like to come along and be part of the audience for that show, just go to the website, the address on your screen right now. Let's go to our second question of the night, which comes from Stephen Roy. Stephen, evening. What's your question? Hello. Is the SNP's new strategy to achieve independence the right one? Thank you very much, Stephen. Tomorrow was to be the day that Nicola Sturgeon set for an independence referendum. Not happening. Instead, we have this new policy. A majority of seats in a general election would provide the mandate to begin negotiations for a referendum. Is this strategy the right one? And if so, why? Neil Gray. Uh, yes, I think it is. It's one that was agreed unanimously by uh, the party and uh, I think there was good debate and discussion uh, amongst the party around the process. I'm glad that we've now discussed the process, we've um, discussed that uh, enough. Uh, I now want to discuss uh, the why of independence and getting on to uh, the case for why uh, I believe that we can make a far better job of running our country uh, based on the views Sorry. of the people who actually live uh, and work here rather than decisions that are made for us uh, by Westminster. And now the question is going to be whether or not the UK government, whichever one comes next, whether it is Sir Keir Starmer or whether it or not is uh, Rishi Sunak, will respect the outcome uh, of a democratic process because there has been a singular failure uh, up until now for the Westminster government to respect <clears throat> the outcome of elections in Scotland. It's high time they've respected democracy and allowed Sue people Weber, to is have that their happen? say of our constitutional I, I, future. When Neil Gray talks about respecting the results of referendum, we had the biggest... Uh, democracy doesn't democracy stand still, Sue. Democracy vote in 2014 when 84.6% of the electorate turned out to vote and they voted no. I think what we also have to remember is... Is it democracy is... a one-off event? Neil, if you it's don't not, mind, let me it? finish. Hang on, okay. hang on. The First Minister, the previous First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, had decided that the next general election was going to be a de facto referendum on independence. Make no bones about it, that is the SNP's one and only goal and aim in life. And the First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, at that point said it was 50% plus one of every single vote that was cast in that general election. Now the new plan is to take it to the majority of MPs elected. So that's gone from their current 
crop of 48 MPs to 29 MPs, and they're going to call that a success. They're going to say that is a democratic mandate for independence. And we all know that in general elections, the turnout could be anywhere between 60 and 70 per cent. And you don't need 50 per cent to win a seat in a general election. They could have a minuscule proportion of the vote, and Hamza Yusuf is going to stand up and say, that is why we need an independence referendum. It is nonsense. The people of this country want to move on, and we want to concentrate on what's important to us, which well, is the things we were just talking about. Let's find out whether the people do want to move on. Let's hear from the people. Man with his hand up there. Yes, on you go. So, yes. My question is, if democracy is fluid, as you're saying, do the no votes then get to wait another 10 years to have another referendum, and then where does it end? So you did lose, which is, you should man up and take it. But you can't just keep saying democracy is all the time. So if you do win the yes vote, do we get to then have another democracy vote for a no vote? And just keep going in this horrible, vicious circle? OK, and thank you. Lady with the glasses up there, yes. Um, I, I just want democracy. Um, we've been refused a Section 30 order by the Tories and to Labour say they'll refuse it. Uh, Tory government have overturned the Scottish Parliament decisions with Section 35. There is the Internal Market Act, which also allows Hollywood decisions to be overturned. There was a Self-Determination Act put forward to the House of Commons, mm -hmm. uh, which, of course, has no chance of success because of the uh, arithmetic in the House of Commons. Um, how on earth do we achieve any kind of democracy, any kind of expression of democratic will of Scots? Do, do you absolutely. Yes, I do. Do you think this new strategy is the right strategy? Sorry. Do you think this new strategy is the right strategy? Um, I need to study it a bit more closely yet, actually, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> but I think it's a move forward, yeah. Now, OK, thank you. Gentleman down here with the glasses. Yes. According to the Commons Library, the Conservative Party in the last hundred years has polled between 30 and 45 per cent of the vote. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that their policies across that 100 yeah. years should never have been enacted? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and lady on the aisle over there, yes. Um, given that uh, the total UK media is anti-independence, I won't say SNP because there are a huge array of different uh, political views within the independence movement. The newspapers are against us, the TV, um, everywhere we? you go. No. Are we? Uh, no. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, BBC, I, I hate to say it. But um, we were recently on an all under one banner um, march. It was not, it was a huge march. It was not mentioned anywhere. Friends have been recently on a pro European Union march in London, not anywhere. Go, my husband loves going into the supermarket and looking at all the newspapers. <laughs> Anti-independence, anti-independence, anti-independence. One, the national, okay. So, so this new strategy, is every, this, do you every, think it's going to change anything? No, no, but the media is against us. How, how can it, the wish for independence still be at 50, the sort it's of grassroots, when in fact people are brainwashed by this oh my rubbish God. media? Oh, okay, you're brainwashed apparently. Let me hear from the man in the front row here, yes. Oh, I'm just sick and tired. 16 years of our SNP government, we've had drug death capital of Europe, we've had the educational attainment gap was supposed to be narrower, according to Nicola Sturgeon, has become wider, and any waiting times have become longer and longer. If, if the SNP can't govern Scotland as a devolved country, what chances do they have of running Scotland as an independent country? All right. Hang, no, 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 you can't. No, you can't. I will, I will come back to you, but not just now. Richard Murphy, is this new strategy, is this the right strategy to deliver independence? Look, it's an improvement on spending your whole time talking about the process of obtaining independence, because, let's be realistic, independence isn't going to happen yet. Because <coughs> Labour and the Tories are united in their desire to retain Scotland as a colony. And the same as they're united in their desire to keep Wales under <laughs> London's control. And bluntly, because Keir Starmer has said it, even though it's contrary to the Northern Ireland Agreement, the Belfast Agreement, he's determined that there'll be no poll in Northern Ireland either, even though it's provided for in the Belfast Agreement. So 
There is no desire in London to give a democratic choice to Scotland. But the point about this strategy, which I like, is it's going to force the SNP to actually change their strategy and talk about why Scotland can survive as an independent country. That is why I got involved in Scottish politics. I'm not Scottish. You know, I live in East Anglia. And actually, I've got an Irish passport. So why, you might say, why am I here? Because mm. my experience in Europe is that Scotland is a mid-sized European country that is more than capable of standing on its own two feet, making its own decisions, raising its own funds, could have a vastly better tax system, could be a fairer country. And it's that that the SNP has got to talk about now, including yep. the rubbish devolution settlement, which yep. doesn't let it deliver the policies you yep. want. In fact, <laughs> constrains well-being in Scotland. That's what the SNP needs to be talking about. Okay. When they win that argument, they might win the argument for independence okay. as well. Okay, okay. Hold that thought. Yep. Gentleman with the beard there, yes. Uh, we talked about uh, why, uh, uh, but not how. Where's the sums, you know, in terms of the actual breakdown of, to convince voters that independence is, is viable? I, Okay. I've been looking, I can't find anything. Okay, thank you. And the lady with the glasses up there. Um, my feeling is that we really need to improve, um, you know, the process of referenda and to get populists more used to doing this on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. I think the Brexit proved that we don't do this regularly enough, we don't do the debates enough, mm -hmm. and then we need to set the process about what triggers a referendum, what the rules are, mm -hmm. and, and how that process works. Like Switzerland. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. I was okay. Going to say Australia. Okay. <laughs> and lady in the white top, the glasses. Yeah. Um, I'm always really surprised to hear how many people are surprised that we still want independence and we still want that referendum to happen. So you mentioned that happened in 2014. 2014 was almost 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. The voters have changed. Yeah. A lot has changed within our country, in our area. Um, I didn't live here in 2014, and best believe I'll be out in polling uh, polling rolls. But um, it, yeah, just I feel like I'm in the twilight zone every time SNP has been elected over and over again, and that is their main mandate, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Yep. I just feel like... Pa Pam Duncan Glancy, speak to that lady up there. It's all they've got, if oh. I'm honest. Oh. Um, because they, they, have, they have nothing else to offer. They've had 16 mm -hmm. years in government, and the country is a mess. Absolutely no institution is better now than it was 16 years ago when they came into government or 13 years ago when the Tories came into government. So but they have nothing else but to go to. that's because you and Labour and SNP set that up. That is because they have nowhere Tories else to go. I fundamentally believe that people want to do more than talk about the constitution. Yep. People want us to sort the NHS. They want opportunity in their lives so that they can grow and they can go on and get out in the world and be the best thing that they can be. They want to have security of their home, security in their communities, security of finance. They want the economy of our country to be better. The economy in Scotland has grown less than the mm. economy across the rest of the UK mm. since the SNP came into yeah. government. And they want to have clean air. Those are the five missions that Labour government will bring, and not just <coughs> for Scotland, but across the whole of the UK, because our ambitions are wide enough for the whole of the UK, not just for Scotland. So, so your what, figures what, what, really how, do how not have Hang on a second. What, what do you say to that woman up there who says, we just want the chance to vote on this? Democracy moves on. We just want to have our say on this. And everybody has a right to have a say, and the next point you'll have a right to have your say will be at the general election. And if you want to vote for progressive policies, if you want to vote to fix the NHS, if you want to vote for opportunities in our country, for a better economy, for security, for better schools, for better um, social care, if you want these things, the opportunity is to vote and Labour. If the, if and that's how you change things, not borders. Governments change things, and, not borders. And if a majority of SNP MPs are elected, as is the new strategy, is that the trigger for a discussion about well, independence? I find it extraordinary that a majority... If you're saying the general I election it, is the... the... The general election is the opportunity to change the lives of the people across Scotland. Not because we move where the border is, but because we change the people making the decisions. That's what the opportunity is at the next general election. And I believe, if Rutherford and Hamilton West is anything to go by, the, the Labour Party, um, the people on the, on the streets believe what we have to offer. They're talking about those things, about the NHS, about the economy, about the cost of living, not about another referendum. Okay. Hang on. Carolyn Curry, I want to hear from you on this. Is the new SNP strategy on this, the revised strategy, is this the way ahead if they want to achieve independence, do you think? I think if we want to progress, we have to have a stable economy. 
fundamentally, we don't have a stable economy. And at the minute, um, economies globally are being subjected to all sorts of different geopolitical <coughs> influences mm -hmm. that we just can't control. And I think, you know, re regardless of, of where you sit on either side of the, the independence debate, if we want to succeed as a nation, we have to stabilise our economy. We have to create an economy that is accessible for everybody. Mm -hmm. And that should be our focus. Actually, we have incredible talents in this country. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a time where we should all be coming together. And we do all come together across the political divide in, in some elements. My area of work is one where I see real cross-party collaboration. And I think this is a time where we should be really focusing on some of the critical issues that are facing our country and not really getting too distracted by some elements of our future. I think economic stability, mm -hmm. accessibility for decent wage, decent career opportunities for all, decent education and our health care are our priorities right now as a nation, and we should really focus on R them. Richard Murphy, is independence a distraction? <laughs> no, independence isn't a distraction, and the reason why is that Scotland cannot make the decisions about its own future. Mm -hmm. It hasn't got its own tax system, it hasn't got its own currency, it can't set its own policies suitable to the people of this country. And there's not another group like this of the size of five million plus people in Europe who are denied that opportunity when they so clearly and a lot of people in Scotland do want it. But the point I'm going to make is that you can't solve this from Westminster. Rachel Reeves' numbers do not add up. Mm -hmm. They simply are impossible. You cannot deliver what she's talking about, growth without government spending more, and she's promised no tax cuts, and she's hardly going to borrow a penny. That's not going to deliver anything. The mm -hmm. Tories have given us years of austerity, and the SNP have had no darn choice because they've had to spend what they've been given by Westminster. Let's be clear, that is Scotland's problem that Scotland is given what Westminster wants to give it, okay. and it doesn't get a choice. All the SNP can do is shuffle the budget while they're here. All good marks for trying, but in practice, you can't change the outcome. That's why it's so uh, bad, and that's what's got to change. If you want change, you can't do it inside a system where Westminster won't give you the power oh, to do okay. it. OK, let me hear from that man there. Yeah, on you go. The original question was around the new strategy of the SNP, mm. so let me get this right. We wake up the morning after the next general mm. election, you have lost dozens of seats <laughs> and your calculation is that that's more of a mandate for independence than the day before. Yeah, Can you just talk us through how that makes sense to anyone except those who were in the hall? Because it's just as possible that the Tories could le lose dozens of seats and still form a majority government at Westminster and have a mandate to deliver upon their manifesto. Mm. Why is that not the case in Scotland? If we get the majority of seats, we have won the election in Scotland. It's the people of Scotland have taken a decision and it is important that we see a respect of democracy. And we haven't seen that come forward, either from Pam and her answer, because she hasn't given us a route for how there can be a democratic expression of people's wishes, as the lady uh, has suggested, nor as uh, the lady uh, had previously outlined. So I'm still to hear what the democratic route is by which people can actually have an expression of their democratic wishes on their constitutional future. But it, and but, I agree, but Neil, I agree, you, hold on a second, you, I agree with, Neil, I agree with Caroline. if you won 48 seats in 2019 and that didn't change anything, how could 29 seats yeah. in 2024 yeah. change Yeah, but, well, because we, uh, an additional part of our... Um, and actually, you're making the case, <laughs> you're making the case, you're making the case for independence better than I could, that we continue to win elections in Scotland, the people of Scotland continue uh, to elect in, us by a majority of seats at Westminster, we have a pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament, and yet we're still denied the opportunity to have a discussion about our constitutional future. It is an appalling okay, state of no, 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 Please can I Please can I Because this no, is important. The, econ no, the economic no, argument is critical, right? What but that's Caroline, not the question, Neil. Caroline, the man in the blue shirt there. Let me go to you. On you. Um, I think there's an answer to be said for proportional representation, which could answer some of these questions around the first past the post system. Mm. And if Keir Starmer or Rishi Sunak would come into power and change the Westminster system, that might make it a more continual democratic mm. proportional system, which could then solve the answer of, you know, if SNP win the most number of seats in Scotland, that kind of gives a bit more of a proportional idea rather than the first past the post system. Yeah. So that could be somewhat towards solving the and with problem a proportional, of continual democracy. And with a proportional system in Scotland, we've got a pro-independence majority in the Scottish Parliament. Not and yet 
we're plus still one of the votes. in a situation where we've been denied the opportunity to have our say over our constitutional okay, future. Okay, okay. And I agree with what Carolyn was saying about the economy. All right. Because she's absolutely right that we need to make sure we focus on Neil, the economy. Neil, that's not the question. The question is, is the SNP's new strategy to achieve independence okay. the right one? Gentleman with the glasses there. I just wanted to follow up on that point about the voting system and welcome Sue Webber's commitment to changing the system because you said how unfair it is that with the first past the post Westminster election, <laughs> MPs that. can be elected with maybe just 30% of the vote. Mm -hmm. If we had a fairer voting system, we wouldn't have this yeah. problem of trying to use a Westminster election to yeah. achieve this. The fairest way to decide this, of course, is with a referendum. And whilst I agree you can't have them all the time, um, it is now nine years since the last independence referendum. Things have totally changed because of Scotland mm -hmm. being taken out of the European Union against our will, yes. but we absolutely need a new referendum, and that will be the fairest way because everyone would get one vote whether or not they want independence. Sue Webber, briefly. Uh, you, you changed and turned my words around slightly, obviously, when you were talking about uh, proportional representation, but there's never a fair, fair way in terms of electoral systems, but there are fairer ways, and there is an argument around proportional representation, yes. uh, and, but we see how even in the Scottish Parliament, which was never created in terms of a proportional representation system to have a majority as we have now of the, in the Greens and the SNP coming together. It was designed to have a coalition and a supportive and so people were cooperative and worked together to get things through that the country supported. Got. If you don't mind, please. <laughs> you know, many of the really, really controversial uh, laws that the Scottish Government have attempted to pass have been the ones that the public have not been supportive of. We just have to look back at the gender recognition bill and then we have to also then consider some of the stuff that's also um, quite pertinent right now in terms of the highly protected marine areas. Okay. All of these are being pushed through because of the numbers in Parliament and that's where we are. So okay, we'll all right, okay. Uh, your views on all of this, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media. We love to hear from you. Let's mm -hmm. go to our next question of the night, which comes from Olivia Boyce. Olivia. Hi. Evening. How can Edinburgh's housing crisis be fixed? Right. You say housing crisis, Olivia. What's your experience? Um, I rent currently and um, I spend more, well, about half my wage on rent and bills. It just seems to be a totally unsustainable sort of situation. I feel like landlords are really, really greedy and I know the Tenant Protection Act came in and sort of helped people within tenancies, but it did nothing for people moving between, which affects a lot of students. Every time you seem to leave a flat, the landlords hike the price up and the flat are often not a great standard and, you know, there's... I mean, Liz Trust absolutely ruined the, the thought of ever being able to save up for a mortgage. Mm. It's just totally unsustainable. So you're just paying basically to live in substandard housing. And I just don't... I know that the government's planning to bring in a rent control system. I don't know when that's going to happen. And the problem is rents are already far too high. And if you now say that you're going to bring them down, landlords will be like, well, we can't afford that. But something needs to be done because okay. it's just totally mm. mad. OK, thank you. It's a very hot issue here in Edinburgh. Sue Webber, former city councillor mm. here. What do we do about Edinburgh's housing crisis? We need to build more homes. I think that's where we need to do And the ones that we have got, uh, we need to make better in terms of the quality. Uh, I, some of the casework that I get, some of the most horrific casework I get is around housing issues. People are waiting two years to get uh, social housing in, in the city. And those that are in social housing have got some horrific circumstances uh, in terms of the quality. We're seeing more and more people having to move outside of the city to get affordable homes, and that's putting pressure on many other services. So we've got lots of people now moving to West Lothian, Mid Lothian, uh, and Fife, and that then puts different pressures onto the city because of the, the transport system for people to come in to where the work is. So, uh, quite frankly, the, we need to build more homes and we need to build them more quickly. That's really bad English, I'm sorry about that, but uh, that's where we are, and they're not being built fast enough. And in the city, the whole, the regulations around planning, the aspiration, the challenges that are all faced around uh, people just not accepting that harsh reality that we ultimately need to build more homes. OK, Carolyn Curry. Yeah, I completely agree. We need to be building new homes at speed. We have got a housing crisis, mm. and that is really bad for an economy. We need to be able to ensure that people who are studying, who are trying to gain skills, are well supported, mm -hmm. can, can have the very basics a safe house to stay in while they're studying and learning. We know from Scotland's productivity, which has flatlined for years, that skills are key to boosting our economy, mm -hmm. to getting into new expanding sectors that pay higher wages and have exciting future opportunities. 
So that takes us back to we have to be able to support students much better than we can to gain those skills of the future. But also, we need to be able to make housing affordable for those that are moving into work and who aspire to have a mortgage and actually own a home one day as well. So we need to be looking at schemes that have been effective. So some of the shared equity schemes, for example, that enable people to get on the mortgage ladder and start with um, have been successful. Some of the saving products that help people to save up for mm. what is a substantial amount in order to get on that, that housing ladder. But fundamentally, there are not enough houses. Mm. So we need to invest in the infrastructure that is going to make that happen at speed. Yes. That needs institutional infrastructure investors to come into Scotland mm -hmm. and help us to scale up and to do that. OK, we'll talk about how we can maybe do that. Man on the front row, though. Um, yes, there's lots of good talk about um, new homes being built, but what about schools? What about hospitals? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the infrastructure mm -hmm. that these people need. Schools in the one. city are, are under pressure. Yeah. So are um, GP surgeries. Mm -hmm. All these things are, are, aren't being considered. They aren't getting the political priority. That's part of the picture as well. And a man with the glasses in the middle. Yeah, on you go. Uh, most businesses, I suppose, have um, been able to put prices up with their increased costs, but with recent sort of government interventions, landlords have not had that opportunity. So I believe a lot of landlords have exited the market and obviously that's affected the, the supply. 3% cap on, exactly, on yeah, rises here uh, in uh, Scotland. Yeah. Richard Murphy. I know a little bit about this because I have a goddaughter who lives down the road in Leith. Um, so uh, she told me about the problems. Um, and they're not alone to Edinburgh, let's be totally honest. Uh, this problem is seen in London, it's seen in Dublin, by the way, it's seen in many cities mm. around the countries. Uh, and I know Dublin is not in the UK, just in case. But let's talk about what the real problems are. First of all, we haven't taxed the ownership of homes. Now, that sounds like an odd place to start. But actually, the result has been that people have not sold their homes. They've kept them to the end of their lives and they've passed on their homes to their children. Oh, the think. consequence of that has been we have an increasing number of homes owned by fewer people. It's part of the problem that the UK as a whole has with the concentration of wealth. And therefore, there are more people renting than there used to be because more people are inheriting. And they don't inherit the family home. They inherit the opportunity to rent. So we need to look at whether we should tax the capital gains that people have made on their homes during their lifetime to enforce the sale of houses back into the market at potentially lower prices. It's radical. It would raise 10 plus billion pounds a year. I've done the numbers. It's possible. The other thing we need to do is get the Bank of England to change its policy with regard to interest rate rises. Because at the moment, the biggest curse for the renter is the fact, as you mentioned, the re rents are going up dramatically. Why are they going up dramatically? Because the Bank of England is putting up interest rates and the interest rate goes straight into rent. In Sweden, they've calculated the impact of this. And I looked at the numbers the other day. Half of Swedish inflation is down to the impact of interest rate rises, most of which comes into the economy through rents. So all this nonsense, you heard it's high pay rises which are creating inflation, or anything else, nonsense. It's mainly landlords who are delivering this. Oh, okay. And they're doing so to pay the interest. The Bank of England has okay. to cut interest okay. rates. Okay, let me hear from the audience, home. Richard. Man there, yes. Yeah, I have to agree, actually. I think one of the problems as well is definitely shortage that you've mentioned, but there's, there's also talk of PBSA, um, which is um, uh, purpose-built purpose student accommodation. Mm -hmm. It's not a solution. These are mostly privately built purpose-built yeah. student accommodation. Mm -hmm. They're for profit. And I think another point of discussion here is caps, caps on rent, like the, the woman mentioned at the beginning. That's not being discussed enough in, in cities like Edinburgh. We just see peaks and peaks going up and up. And how do you get a mortgage when you're actually ultimately paying rent to pay someone else's mortgage? Yep. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy, how do we I, fix Edinburgh's I, housing crisis? I think the, the point that there has just been made just now about purpose built student accommodation is really, really important because students across Scotland um, and in Edinburgh, and I've, I've spoken to a number of students in Edinburgh um, and universities, in fact, about this particular issue. Um, the, the options available to students in Edinburgh and across Scotland are, are limited, actually. There are not many 
um, leases that they can access that allows them to be there for term time, but perhaps to move away if they don't want to be there for the whole year. Um, there are not uh, affordable rents that people can, aff that people can afford. They're also um, in situations where the, the, the housing is not up to scratch, it's not up to standard, so people are living in accommodation that is unsuitable. There's not enough space. They can't have free space to, to study and to sleep. Um, and, and this, so there's very limited options. The purpose-built student accommodation, I think, um, is causing some, uh, some different problems, but problems nonetheless, because it may seem like a, a solution. Some universities think it's a good solution because of particularly it's available in term time. It's purpose-built for that um, particular purpose, um, hence the name. But actually what's happening is money is being sucked out of communities and going to out of the country um, into other countries where um, the landlords and the people who own those properties are taking the rents from that. That's not helping our local communities. It's not helping our local businesses. And in, and in fact, they don't think about the bigger picture on the community. So we don't get the GP surgeries, we don't get the schools in place, and communities become quite fractured, actually, because there isn't that community approach to house building. And I think that is one of the really key problems for students um, in, in Edinburgh, but across Scotland as okay, well. Okay, uh, gentleman on the, on the aisle up there. Yes, on you go. Uh, why don't we look at uh, taxing fully second homes? and also completely discouraging buy-to-let as investment, because I feel that's a huge problem in Ed Edinburgh. Mm. Everybody wants to get on to make money, and I think the government or the local authority will step in to build more affordable homes. Mm. And, and for me, from my experience, I think these two are correlated, and it's so the rich getting richer, and so like the student or anyone can't mm. even get a home or even rent a home because it's so expensive. Thank you. A uh, gentleman at the back with the glasses. Yeah. I echo what the gentleman there has just said. I think one of the issues is the one of the solutions put forward is just to build new homes. But I've seen time and again that these new homes are bought to then go straight onto the market as buy-to-lets, where there's no opportunity for people who need those that housing to actually get on there. And it's like it's being used as a as a profit accumulator. Okay. As the gentleman just this said. gentleman in a white shirt shaking his head down here. I agree with everyone about more homes, but let's not get down on the buy-to-let landlords. When I was a young professional, social housing was never going to be for me because that's for families and things. There was no way I could have bought somewhere. If there wasn't a vibrant private mm. letting market in Edinburgh, where would I have lived? Yeah. Your views on all of this, the hashtag is BBCDN on social media. We've got time for one final question tonight, and it comes from Chand Kaur. Where are you, Chan? Evening. Evening. Um, so my question comes from the recent events that are going on with Israel and Palestine. And I want to know when will UK be ready to welcome innocent mm -hmm. Palestinian citizens into the UK just the way they did for the Ukrainian citizens? Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> um, First Minister said yesterday at conference Scotland is willing to be the first country in the UK to offer safety and sanctuary to those caught up in these terrible attacks. Our hospitals will treat the injured women and children of Gaza when we can. Sue Webber. I think what we've seen unfolding in the last while has been shocking and horrific. It's certainly been uh, something I've not been seeking out to watch uh, on social media and uh, the television. And I know that it's not right that we have so many innocent people on both sides, in both Israel and Palestine, that are caught up in this fighting. It's uh, horrific. And let's not forget that the Palestinians are not Hamas and Hamas are not the Palestinian people. And I think that is something we have to be resolute about in our beliefs. Um, we know what happened in Israel was horrific and they have the right to defend themselves from that level of a terrorist attack. Um, it's important now that we make sure there are safe havens and for people that are fleeing Gaza to get out. And James Cleverly has been working with the Egyptian government to make sure that that border is reopening. And we've seen Rishi Sunak pledge 10 million pounds in humanitarian aid. And that's important to get that into the Gaza as much as it is to get the people out that are fleeing. That's five quid for every person in Gaza. Can we just be clear about that? Well, thank you, Richard, for pointing that out. Uh, I think, you know, today we saw parties from across the chamber in Westminster coming together in support of making sure that no one, uh, no civilians are, who are innocent in this are harmed and we have to do that. And remember that whatever happens, there are and is international laws that must be adhered to and abided by. And I think that's really important that the other the international governments hold that 
uh, that's not really the question. The question is about welcoming people here, refugees here, and looking after them here, opening uh, our doors here, the way that we did. Keep we have done that, and should, we've done that in the past so for we Syrians. Again in this, in this I don't want to uh, say yes or no to that, but should there come a time when that is necessary, then I'm sure we will put a, a scheme in place to allow that to happen. Uh, we are a country that is a safe haven for many fleeing conflict, and we will continue to do that. Richard Murphy. I'm baffled by that answer, I've got to tell you. Because we are not a country that is a safe haven for people fleeing conflicts. We force them to cross the channel in small boats and yes. risk their lives. Yes. For heaven's sake. That's well, they should not have to leave Gaza because they're terrified and then get on a small boat. Remember, half the population of Gaza is under the age of 20. They are going to be traumatised. The biggest population group of all in Gaza, if you're stratifying five-year bands, are naught to four-year-olds. Mm -hmm. What did they do to justify to be in this? We should be saying we're going to be part of an international community that opens its doors now, that does not wait until we have some scheme in place, that does not force people to get into this situation. The people of Gaza, those who are living in absolute fear, have a right to get out of that situation. It's not the fault that, of them that they are there. Okay, we need out. to help okay. them and we Th need to do it. Now. Neil Great, I mean, there's an issue of practicality about this, which is the border is more or less closed at the moment mm. to, to actually get people out, never mind get them over here, and that would require the UK government to work with you on this. But, well, yes, and the, 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 we know the Rafa crossing has been bombed, and uh, ha there is a uh, a horrendous situation uh, facing Palestinians uh, in Gaza that we've already uh, heard about from, from Sue and from Richard. It's an appalling situation. We must absolutely condemn uh, the atrocities of Hamas. Uh, however, the collective punishment uh, of Palestinians uh, is also equally wrong, and we cannot allow it to see that uh, happen. Um, I think the First Minister this week, who has been facing his own personal trauma here, has uh, in-laws are currently trapped uh, in Gaza, has shown incredible international leadership uh, on this matter. He is the one that has been leading in calling for a ceasefire, calling for humanitarian uh, corridors, uh, and for us to see uh, the uh, Palestinians who are wishing to flee to be able to arrive here and be welcomed in the same way that we welcomed uh, those from Ukraine that I previously You organised the ships? For I, I previously had a responsibility for because they were fleeing a war zone and we had to make sure... And we should do the same way. again. In Absolutely, okay, we should okay. be... Okay. Gentlemen, with his hand up there. So the answer is just simply yes. yes. Yeah. That, that is it. Yeah. So instead of politicians like you're doing just now, chatting for five minutes and going off a, a tangent, the answer is just simply yes. 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 Do it now. Yes. Pam so why not do it right yeah. now? Yeah. I, I agree. I think the answer is and, and should be yes. yes. Um, what what I think is really important, and, and first of all, like like others have have already said, I utterly condemn the actions of Hamas that we've seen um, in in recent weeks, and it is heartbreaking to see what's happening. Um, across the Middle East. And we know that there are people, that, that there are loved ones that we have um, here that are deeply, deeply affected by it, not least the First Minister um, and his family. And, and, and all of us have felt it this week for him um, and for uh, others who are currently living in the Middle East. Uh, I, I was at a visit um, in, in Glasgow this week and one of the people who was showing me around in the visit stopped to take a call from a student mm. um, who was on a, a, a placement over, um, over in the Middle East and they had been repatriated. It was a university that had made mm. um, the, the attempts to get them repatriated and got them back home. But they were genuinely terrified. But the person that they had um, exchanged with was really, really worried about having to go back. Mm. And um, the, the, the you know, have put in place measures so that they don't have to. And that is the sort of compassion that I think we need to show as a country. Mm. Because right now there are atrocities being affected and people dying in numbers that People cannot imagine scenes that I never thought I would see mm. um, on our televisions right now. And we need to show compassion. We need to act decisively. We need to act fast because pace um, is really, really important in this. And crucially, we have to de-escalate as much as we can because whenever things escalate, particularly in the Middle East, we also see escalation of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in our country too. And we have to have a zero tolerance approach to that in our country because we can't tolerate that 
threats or what we're seeing across the Middle East okay. um, for humanity at all. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Man in the front row first. Um, I, I think the UK government can do a lot here. I think the UK government can stop sending weapons of arms to Israel because when Israel are using these airstrikes, they've got weapons that are made in the UK. So I think the U UK can stop selling these weapons to Israel. It can play a big part okay, thank in you, peace. Thank you. Carolyn Curry. How, how can you not respond? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that this yeah. is a, a humanitarian tragedy of unbelievable proportions. Yeah. As a human being, how can we see that and not want to respond? Mm -hmm. We have to respond. You know, I want to be part of a nation and a country that has a response to something like this, that can provide a safe haven to these horrendous atrocities and that, that takes a leadership stance that says, yes, you're welcome here, yeah. because that is the first part of resolving this. Uh, uh, the politics around it are incredibly complex. Uh, we know this is not going to be a simple thing. But as they say, you know, every... Every piece of history starts with a first step. And I think, as a nation, we have to stand up. As human beings, we have to say, you're welcome here. We want to help, yeah. you know? We are ready and we are willing and we want to do this. And that's the type of Scotland that I want to be proud to be part of yep. and to live in. Yep. Chan, you asked the question, have you heard what you wanted to from the panel? So I'm quite surprised. Uh, disappointed the way that Sue handled that question and I pr appreciate the other panel members how they were very supportive. When we talk about Rishi Sunak and saying that he will give £10 million, was that after the big protest that took place across the country and was that after when the Home Secretary had said that waving a Palestinian flag could be a sign of crime mm. as well as chanting freedom mm. and why has he not gone to speak to Palestinian citizens within the UK? Why has he not gone to schools and the mosque or where they go to pray? Why is it just he's, he's supporting the Jewish people? Both parties okay. have been affected. And I'm the not Prime taking Minister away, did actually I'm not standing the... from okay. one side. Okay. But let, why let, is it just yeah, showing one side? Point. Let Sue respond. On you go, Sue. The, the Prime Minister has met with leaders from Palestine themselves. I mean, he has not been working only on one side. They are aware, our, our politicians from Westminster are aware, that this is a very complex matter and you cannot be attributing blame to either side. We have to find, to find a way forward Everyone has to be involved in the discussions. Okay. 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 We, we are we are out of time. I'm afraid we could spend uh, another hour, on, I'm sure, on this one question this evening. But that's it for tonight. We're back next week. We will be in Motherwell next week. You can apply to be part of the audience on our website. There's the address on your screen. If you missed any of tonight's show, we're on a bit later on BBC One Scotland. You can watch the repeat or watch it any time that suits you on the BBC iPlayer. Thank you very much indeed to my panel here tonight and to our audience here in Edinburgh and to you at home watching wherever you are in Scotland. Scotland. We'll see you next week. In the meantime, stay safe, stay well from all of us on Debate Night. Good night.